today's scripture is taken from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 7. Listen for the word of God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had, had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, God's home is new among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the, and the end, to all who are thirsty. I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. <clears throat> Today's sermon is titled For Free and uh, will be delivered by Pastor Thomas Prince. May God give us a word for our heart, and a heart for His word. Amen. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, imagine this. You find an email in your inbox, which subject line tells you that you just won one million Taiwanese dollars. How do you react? <coughs> Most of you, I assume, would send this email straight to their spam folders. Even more certainly, if you don't, before you start online researching for a new car or planning a new or the next fancy vacation, you would ask yourselves, why? Why would I get such an amount for really doing nothing, not even buying a lottery ticket? In almost every case, very <coughs> unfortunately, of course, this email would turn out to be a scam. Where is the catch? I believe this is how most of us would immediately react if someone offers us money or another valuable thing for free. We don't believe in these kinds of gifts from companies or from strangers. Experience teaches us that at some later point I will have to give something back in return for what I receive. Think of the many gaming apps for our smartphones that are out there. You can download them for free at many times, but after some time, usually once you're hooked, they offer you in-app purchases to boost your level or to be able to continue playing. In order to get something, I have to do something myself. Quit pro quo. Something for something as the Latin phrase goes. We have grown accustomed to this kind of logic of exchange, something for something. And I want to stress here, this is not a bad thing, it is a good thing. Parents teach this logic to their kids to prepare them for life outside of their circle of family and friends, outside of this familiar circle for life in the so-called real world. 
there's another logic ingrained in the so-called real world. You just need to go to the next department store, to the next Sogo in Zhongshan Station, for example, to experience this logic firsthand. It is the logic of supply and demand, which usually determines the value of a product. A product that is short in supply, but very popular, becomes very valuable. The lucky company which sells this good can ask for a high price as long as the customers are willing to pay for it. And of course, as long as there's no other serious competitor on the market which offers a similar product. If, however, something is readily available for everyone, at any place and at any time, who would be willing to pay for this good more than just the minimum price? it would not be valuable. Considering this basic logic, companies set that price for their goods, which creates the maximum profit. I'm sure those of you who work in the world of business would know much more about this and would be able to explain this much better than I do here. <coughs> Who are thirsty, I will give freedom <coughs> from the springs of the water of life. This is the verse from our biblical reading for today that I would like to focus on. One can also translate this verse as follows. To all who are thirsty, I will give from the springs of the water of life for free. The Greek text really speaks of something here that is given to me as a gift. Something that is really given freely, for free. This short verse strongly contradicts the entire logic of value and exchange that I was just talking about. That logic that we have grown so accustomed to use in our everyday lives. And uh, I would like to stress this point here. This line, this short line of our biblical reading, really shatters our worldly wisdom to bits and pieces. It really is contradicting it so strongly. But what is exactly this water of life? What is this gift that we are promised to receive? In the preceding lines, we get a clue of what just that means. The water of life, in short, is life in fullness, fullness <coughs> of life. John, the author of the book of Revelation, paints a beautiful and powerful picture here. Drawing from many traditions of the Bible, he envisions the new Jerusalem, the holy city. What people have been longing for for ages, <coughs> will be fulfilled in this very place, in the holy city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. God will live with his people. He himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain. All these things are gone forever. God loves us humans. He loves his creatures who are made in his image. This is the major threat that we can find all over in the Bible, in the different books, in the different stories, in the different passages of the Bible. And here, at the end of the last book of the entire Bible, we see this good news taking shape in these beautiful images. The water of life stands for all the things humanity has been dreaming of and longing for, for ages. Because of this, naturally, the water of life must have tremendous value. It must be the most valuable thing of all. And yet, as we read, 
It is for free. If you try to apply the logic of value and exchange to that, I guess that a bottle of this water of life must be worth billions and trillions of dollars, even if that bottle would be readily available. It must be a price that no one of us can afford. And yet, here this water of life is described as free. <coughs> This is wonderful, this is good news. But the water of life also comes with some kind of catch as well. Though this kind of catch is not like the same that we are used to in the pay-to-play phone apps, of course. Those who are thirsty will be given the water of life. There is no purchase and no exchange of goods or services here. There's nothing we can give, only something that we can receive in this situation. We find ourselves completely depending on God, longing for the water of life that He provides. For everyone who internalized this worldly logic of value and exchange that we are so used to, this is an unusual and uncomfortable position to be in. In fact, I think this is a surprisingly great challenge. Because in this life, I'm always told to work hard to get very far. So in this situation as well, in the situation of the water of life, I naturally feel that urge to do something to do anything to prove that I am good enough, to prove that I am capable of working hard, that I am capable of doing good things, and so on. But in this situation, we don't need to do that. We simply need to receive. In this situation, we are the ones depending entirely on God and have nothing to give back in return. Because, as the text says, God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This fact also creates a special situation among all of us. We are all the same before God, equally depending on His life-giving water. Here in this life, usually, financial means differ greatly. Some can afford things that others cannot afford. This is one thing, among many other things, that separates us from each other in this lifetime. More often than not, material wealth determines which places people live in, which places they go, and also, eventually, which people they hang out with. Material wealth defines so much of our society today. But when it comes to receiving the truly valuable water of life, these differences are completely irrelevant. These are the things that make this notion of God's life-giving water powerful, but also challenging for us. If we read on in this text, the book of Revelation presents us with another challenge. We read the last verse of our biblical reading, All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God and they will be my children. And if we read even on another verse, which is not included in today's biblical reading, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars, 
Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. What a shocking difference to the word of God's life-giving water. It is another language, a language that is stressing what we need to do and what we could face if we don't do it. This dark imagery might remind some of you of the movie Along with the Gods or other popular depictions of the afterlife and hell. In his revelation, John describes a battle of good versus evil. He sees the evil represented in the Roman Empire of his time. And his language is deeply rooted in the apocalyptic tradition of his time. This is the particular context of John's words in today's reading. And I think it is important to recognize this context. At the, at the, at the same time, I think, as troubling as this context may sound to us today, this context that we are facing in the book of Revelation, it is important to know that it does not change the basic message of hope that we find in today's reading. This message of hope is echoed throughout the Bible. In the Gospel of John, Jesus himself tells the woman from Samaria about a water of life that will drench her thirst forever. For all that we know, Jesus never took money from his audience. I think he could have, like others did, but Jesus decided not to charge his audience. If Jesus had charged money for his teachings, I am sure some people would have been more eager to come see him. A free offer, of course, is always a nice thing to have, but a free offer also doesn't really seem like good quality. An expensive offer, however, would have, it made, would, would have made it more special. Not everyone would be able to afford to go, so it would be also a more exclusive event. Only those who contribute money will be allowed in. But Jesus did not ask people to give their money. Jesus' gospel is not like an in-app purchase. Instead, Jesus asked for something much more. He asked his audience to dedicate their whole lives to him and to the God that he is preaching to them. Listening to God's word is free. This is as true today as it was in Jesus' time. As Christians, we do collect money for a lot of important causes to support the life of the church, to cover our bills, to take care of our finances. But never must the church take money for simply listening to God's word. Listening to God's word must always be free. And this is a really essential point for us Christians. Here at the M, you can even get a free English Bible if you contact our staff. And I think both of this together, listening to God's word, joining us for our worship service, and receiving the Bible, is a great reminder that stresses the point that God's life-giving water is also for free. There are many loud voices in this world today that tell us that valuable things need to be expensive. We must give something in order to receive something. 
Today's biblical reading tells us otherwise. The truly valuable things in our lives are for free. The things that make this life really meaningful don't follow the logic of value and exchange that are dominant in our everyday life. <coughs> true love and affection, true friendship follow a different logic. This sheds a different light on our everyday lives. And this helps us to see more clearly what is important to us. This helps us to see what is truly valuable in our lives. This is not to say that we should be careless with our finances, of course. And yes, we need to make money, we need to generate an income. And if the most basic needs of life are met, people cannot have a fulfilled life. We need to find something to eat and drink. We need to meet our basic needs. This is also not to say that we shouldn't enjoy buying these new pairs of boots that we kept wanting to buy, or that we love the new gadget we have been saving up for and finally bought for ourselves. It is, however, to say that true well-being comes from a different source, and that material wealth cannot bring us any closer to this source. In our text, John envisions a meaningful life for us, a life in fullness. This is the water of life. His vision wants to tell us how to live our lives today. This future that he's depicting, this future inspires me. It helps me recognize good things happening around me, although these good things might be very small in scale. This future gives me hope. This vision pictures a world that I want to live in. It also motivates me to get active and work for this world to become reality. It gives me strength to work for this better tomorrow. It protects me from giving up and becoming cynical whenever I must confess this world is nowhere close to this bright future, nor does it seem that things are getting, are getting much better. This future is for all of us, for us to look up to, for us to fight for, for us to hope for, and for us to long for. This future is valuable beyond any measure. And God gives us this future for free. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, always with us, always surrounding us. You give us life, life in fullness, for free. Guide our spirits by the vision of your bright future as we live each day here in this world. Let us spread your love and your good news freely, and let us become a sign of hope for each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.